you go. There we are. There we are. Somebody said game on. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, Shabbat Shalom. You know, I don't get the opportunity uh, just to, you know, uh, online community, give me a break for a second. But uh, I don't get the opportunity a lot to sit in the back and watch you guys and get to see you guys. And, man, you guys look great. You really do. Your worship and just, uh, just it's just really neat to get to sit back there. I, was, I told uh, uh, Scott, who's also back there, helping. we're a little short-handed in the media department. So if you are a media person or want to learn, come see Steve in the back after service. Um, so, but it's really good to watch just the community. I was watching y'all dance over here and just add, watching some of you late guys come in. It's wonderful to watch. Praise the Lord. Yes, and I was watching some of you talk, young people, during service. All right. So, Matt, good to see you and your, your, your young people right there. Praise God. Good to see you guys. Well, uh, if you don't know who I am, my name is Mike Scan. I am the senior pastor here, uh, one of the elders, and uh, you have joined us at part three of our message, uh, Letter to the Hebrews. Obviously, it says that I've got a little bit of feedback here. And um, it's really exciting. So we've kind of been in this, in this place that we're, we're going to be in it, but we're not going to be in it. And I'll explain myself here. Uh, we've been in dealing with the, the deity of Messiah. We've been really focused in on that because we have to understand that the letter of Hebrews begins, remember, this is a book written to Jewish people by a Jewish person. We know that for a fact. The thing is, so he's got to lay a foundation. The author is laying this amazing foundation to hopefully spark the interest and them coming into reading this entire letter and not kind of skip out on them, right? So he's got to build this foundation. The most critical foundation that you have to build that you're building with him is who is Messiah? Who's Jesus? Like, who is this guy? And so if you, if you understand Judaism... They don't believe that Jew, the, the, the Jewish people, the Orthodox believers, do not believe that Yeshua, Jesus, as we know, is the Messiah. And so last week, actually the last couple of weeks, we really spent a lot of time dealing with this deity. If you're wondering what I'm meaning by deity, maybe this is, uh, you know, this kind of, this, this language is new to you. We're, we're talking about, is Jesus God? Is he God? And so most of us in here, in, right, and online would say yes and amen, but there is, there is a cancer that's coming into the church, and the cancer is Jesus wasn't God. He's just an ordinary person. He's just someone, Yahweh, God the Father, Elohim, endowed with power, endowed with his spirit, and then he became known who we know as Jesus, the Messiah. And uh, I've talked about this extensively because we still hear it. We still hear it. I had someone come to me not too long ago, and they were walking around in our, in our community and uh, during Oneg, and they heard conversations. And the conversations were basically misleading to or leading to the idea that Messiah wasn't the Messiah or wasn't Jesus, uh, as we know him, the deity, uh, questioning his deity. And I think it's great that you can do that. Like, we live in a country that you can do that. Like, I'm going to question that. But that's great, but don't leave it there. Right? Go do home and do your homework. Read your Bible. Pray. And as Paul says, repeat. This stuff I know sounds deep when we start talking about his deity, and, but it really isn't. Like when we look at the Bible and we see what's been said. Now today piggybacks right with that. I'm going to kind of back, uh, go back and forth a little bit about his deity again. But I'm also going to show you some things that if they just give more evidence towards his deity. But the reason why we understand that is because when we understand his deity, then these next few verses, by the way, we should get through chapter one today. <laughs> now, now I, amazing, right, Brooks? He's, um, Brooks is like, yeah, praise God. But here's the thing. Like, if you're new and you're going, well, what's that the big deal? Because it's taken me three weeks just to get through four verses. And now we have seven more plus to go. I think I can do it. Because all of these, this, this, next, this whole next passages are going to be dealing pretty much with the same thing. And so that's why I, I, I believe we're going we're gonna to do it. Praise God. We can do it. All right? Maybe. All right. Praise the Lord. 
So I want to build off of last week. I want to kind of get into this, and, and uh, some of this is going to be sticky. What I mean by that, it may be like the clarity of it is going to be a little discombobulated, uh, but I believe by the end, you'll understand, you'll, you'll, you'll be on the same page. And so d- just keep up with me if you can. I'm going to try not to go too deep. When you're reading the book of Hebrews, it is, it, it is difficult. It's difficult not to get into the deep waters, and I, sometimes we have to remember that some people still have to have floaties on before they get in that deep water, and sometimes I forget, right? And so I get out there in the deep end, and that's not a big deal. It's not like, oh, I'm not as mature or whatever. That's not it at all. Is that this is a very difficult letter to understand. It really is. It can be, and it's been, it's been uh, like misquoted. It's been misused. And so what we want to do is try to bring that clarity, and I try to do it as simply as I possibly can. But sometimes this stuff gets a little bit like, wow, what is, he, what is he really saying? So I heard once, and I maybe even mentioned it a time or two here, that the FBI, um, when they're focusing on trying to catch, um, uh, what is it called, the, the, these uh, counterfeiters, right? These people that counterfeit uh, either checks or they counterfeit money. One of the things that they do is they study not the counterfeit, but they study the real thing. Sometimes in our tour of movement, we do the opposite, don't we? We, st- we focus on the, the false or the other stuff, and we don't focus on the original. I was just talking about this with someone this morning before service and how important it is that we've got to look at the real deal, right? We've got to look at who Messiah really is. Because when you can understand who he is, then, and I said this last week, when the false Messiah appears, and let me tell you, he is going to appear, we already know that the spirit of the anti-Messiah is already prevalent in this world. That's biblical. We already know that's happened. But eventually one day, someone is going to appear, and he will declare himself as Messiah, but he'll be a false Messiah. So then we go, well, as a church, as a community, as followers of Mashiach, as followers of the real deal, how in the world are we going to prevent ourselves from being deceived? Because when you look at Scripture... It says that even some of the, the elect could be deceived. Can you imagine that for a moment? Like, I don't believe any. If we stood everybody up in a line in a circle in the room right today, and there's quite a few of y'all, and even online, and I walk by each and every one, all the elders are like, will you be deceived? No, I'm standing with Jesus, right? But there's a time coming where even the people that are saying no could very well be deceived. And the only way to beat that, the only way to understand that is, number one, know your Bible and know the real deal. Know who Messiah is. Know about Messiah. Study Jesus. Study him. Get to know him. Like, the best way for my marriage to work is me to study Robin and to learn of her. Like, what she likes. Like, we tell people in counseling, she's my standard of beauty. Y'all get that? Do y'all understand what that means? Can, can I do a little premarital counseling for a moment, or maybe for marital counseling? Right? Men, this is for you. Girls, sit back, relax. This is for you. Right? But the idea here about Robin being, and this is good. Oh, this is good. Okay, Holy Spirit. Like, this is so good. Because if Robin is my standard of beauty, watch this, men. When Robin ages, and young men who are married to young ladies, they will age. Shocker. But watch what happens. Because I've determined in my heart that she's my standard of beauty, as she ages, my standard of beauty changes with her. Right? Right? Some of you old guys are having an issue with lust because your standard of beauty's jacked up. You got to get that right. Why does that mean anything here? Because Messiah is our standard. And if he's my standard and I'm learning of him, come on, somebody. My standard will always be in the right. My laser focus will always be on Messiah. That's why we're called to be, I haven't even gotten into the text yet. That's why we're called to be imitators or disciples. Somebody just said I might not make it. (laughs) I'm going to have to change you guys, put you guys in the back, praise God. Think about that, though. If Yeshua is my standard, it doesn't matter what. Crazy teaching comes in because I know who Messiah is. It will not shake me. I'm going to be focused. I'm going to be laser focused. Wait a minute. That doesn't match up to the Jesus that I see in the scriptures. And not just the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament. 
but throughout the text, right? Amen. Remember, we don't pick, cherry pick. We don't pick one verse and try to base a theology or a belief system on one passage of Scripture. It has to come to the totality of Scripture, what the whole Bible says. And Jesus is all through the Old Testament, the Tanakh. If you didn't know that, go home and study your Bible. So, so me emphasizing a little bit more about the character and the deity of Messiah should not be a surprise to any of us. I believe, I don't care how long you've been doing this and how long you've been saved, I believe that you'll pull something from this morning if you'll allow the Holy Spirit to do that. So that's what the FBI does. They focus on the, the real deal. What we want to do is continue to do that as we jump off in this this morning. Let's see if this thing works. It does, praise the Lord. No, right, right off chapter 1 through 4. This is where I was going to continue on last week, but we ran out of time. But it says, thus, thus what? I love that word thus. That word thus is one of those connecting words. It's connecting you to what we just talked about, right? Y'all remember what we just talked about, right? In verse 3, let me go back up and read. I didn't, bring, I didn't put it on the board. But the Son is the radiance of His glory and the imprint of His being, upholding all things by His powerful word. When He had made purification of our sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty. Thus He became as far above the angels as the name He has inherited is more excellent. Oh, that's wrong. That's the verse I'm reading right now. Hang on, let me go back. Because in verse 3... Upholding all things by his powerful word. That's where I wanted to hit for a minute. He upholds everything. Some verses say that he created the whole universe. It's created. He upholds the whole universe. That was a point yesterday that Jesus is the center of the universe. You're not. Some of y'all missed that. But you're not. So he says he establishes who Jesus is. He establishes the deity of Messiah in verses 1 through Three, and then in verse four, he says, because of that, or thus, he became, watch this, as far above, as far above the angels as, watch, he, the name he has inherited. Now, don't think this minute for, that this means inherited like, like because, you know, the father died and he got this inheritance. No, it's based upon who he is he inherited this. That's critical. Like, we understand inheritance, like, like when I pass away, then Caleb gets an inheritance, maybe. <laughs> right? Or Jake, maybe grandbabies, whoever, you know, whoever lived the most at that time. That's not what it's talking about here, right? What this is dealing with is because of who Jesus is, because of what we've established in verses 1 through 2, 3, that now he has become, his name he has inherited. What is his name? It's more excellent than theirs. It is a name that's above every name, right? And we'll go into that here in a minute. Now, so now our author does what any good messianic's going to do. He brings the readers back to the Hebrew scriptures. The next few verses are coming out of Psalms 2. They're coming out of Psalms 110. He's bringing in the Psalms. He's going back to the Tanakh to establish his point. This brings us back to what we talked about earlier, right? Is that we've got to look at scripture and study the Bible, once you know that, you'll know the real deal. You won't be deceived. Now, because of who Messiah is, i.e., he is Yahweh in the form of the Son or in the flesh, he continues with his evidence to the Jewish community. He's going to continue to expound upon why we can say what we say about who Jesus is. And that's why I say that within the movement that we see, in this movement of the Torah movement or first century Judean Christians, we see this thing creeping in, and it's a thing of denying who Messiah is. And let me tell you something about that. That's, that's what we have seen in my own, just in my own study, in my own relationships, what we have seen. That when you, this, why, this is so critical, because if you can't get this right, it's that pendulum that I always talk about, right? You've got the pendulum swing, and every one of you have been on it, and every one of you are on it in some aspect of this pendulum. The first part start of that, when that pendulum starts swinging in your life, is when you came to the knowledge of who Jesus was and your need for a Savior, and that you were a sinner bound for hell, bound for eternal judgment against Yahweh. Something happened to you. Some, you were in somewhere, you were in a bad situation, you went to church, something happened, and you realized you needed Jesus. Right? That's where it starts. That thing swings. And then for several years, you just kind of swung in that area of, of, of gr what we call the area of grace. 
Like God's unmerited favor. He did something for you that you couldn't do for yourself. He took the penalty of your sin upon his own back. He died, resurrected, so that you will have eternal life. Love that, right? That's great stuff, right? And then we came to Torah. And Torah's good. There's nothing wrong. I love the Torah. Most of you in here, all of you if not, love the Torah. But you get on this pendulum and you found out you came in by grace and then you discovered the Torah and your eyes are open. You're like, wow, this is so good. And then you start swinging over and over and over and over and you become exactly what the book of Hebrews is and why the book of Hebrews is written. Because don't forget, why was this book written? Because there were Orthodox believers who had received Jesus Christ as their Lord, as their Savior, who came to the knowledge of the truth. And they missed all of the sacrifices. They missed the temple experience. They missed all of the stuff. And they begin to walk away from Messiah. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. Like, well, I'm, I'm not an Orthodox Jew. You may not be, but, but you can fall into the same trap that they were falling in in the book of Hebrews. And they begin to deny who Messiah is. They begin to deny the power of Yeshua. And we have seen it. I've seen it from a church uh, in Vegas, I think, Nevada, or an entire church because of the pastor converted over to Judaism and then completely changed his church over to Judaism. Denying the Messiah. That's a Peter experience, isn't it? That's why last week I said, you've got to come to an understanding of who Messiah is. So it's not we don't just preach this because it sounds good and because it's deep theology. I don't give a rip about that. But we do it so that you will have the tools and be equipped as a follower of Mashiach, Messiah, to be able to stand in those last days. And when the temptation to continue to swing on that pendulum keeps you running over here where you get to a place where you begin to question who Messiah is in your own life, you're in a very, very bad position. So we need to know the truth. This is more than just a son, as we discovered last week. Not just a son, lower S. He is the son, capital S. The position that he holds is powerful. Matter of fact, it's so powerful, the scripture is going to show us here that he's far above angels and any of them of who they might be. Why is that important? Because we kind of finished off last week with that, is that the Orthodox believers, Hebrews, will have this fascination with angelic powers and and angels. They believe in them. I'm not going into study. It's a great study to go into in in what they believed about, about these things. But the whole reason why he's shedding evidence is to prove this. And he's going to say some things here in just a moment as he goes back to the, back to the, uh, the Tanakh, the, the Old Testament. Now, understand this. Since this name has been given, since he is the son of Yahweh, we now have to dive into something that the Hebrew, are, man, he's, this is so genius of what he's going to do. He establishes who Messiah is to do one very important thing, and that is to deal with his authority. So it's not enough just to know who Jesus is. Listen to me. You need to know what he does and, who he, and what he can do. See, the King James Version translates this, the scripture of uh, 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 as being made, but it's actually, uh, and in, even in some cultic groups, they claim this shows that the Son of Man was created by, by mentioning this, this inheritance thing, given that he was made. But the writer does not use a Greek word which means to make here, but the Greek word that he uses is the word to be meaning having become. When Yahweh became man in the person of Yeshua of Nazareth, when he became incarnate at the incarnation, he became a little lower than the angels. When he became human, not as his whole feature as who he is. So let's continue, and this will make sense here in a minute. So looking at verse 5, he says, For to which of the angels did God ever say? Are you Bible thumpers? Think about this. Which angel... You are my son. Today I have become your father. This is this word we're talking about, this Greek word, to make or to be. And he will be to me a son. People typically use that. They think Jesus was created. No, it's 
Wrong Greek word. For again, I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. And again, see, this can get deep, right? And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, what? Let all the angels of Yahweh worship him. Now, I think if you still under, don't understand where we're going here, or you still kind of un, misunderstood this, go back to last week, listen to last week, and then I've also encouraged you last week to go to the Yom Kippur message that we, we talked, because we, we talk extensively on his identity. But the first thing that I want us to see here is that this statement is the beginning of a sort of apologetics of what he's doing. Like he's saying, what angels have a name that's greater than him? What angels have been given this authority? So there's an apologetic thing that can happen. And I know a lot of people get bored. Their, their eyes begin to roll back in their head. They're like, apologetic. Apologetics is the defending or the, or the studying of the scriptures. So there's an apologetic that he's thinking, meaning there's a discussion to the Jewish people that Messiah is God. But now that the author has established this, he moves in to prove that not only, uh, not only who he is, the Son of God, but that he is higher than the angels. In other words, that he not only has more authority than the angels, but that it is equal to that of Yahweh. Now, we can bypass that real quick. Now, I want you to hold on to that thought because you may think, man, you're going way too deep for me, but I'm not. I want you to notice the command at the end of that passage, right? Let all the angels of God worship him. This establishment is its placement of authority. It's establishing who's, who's in charge. Yahweh commands the angels to worship the son. Now, although today some non-Messianic Jews reacting against Christianity insist that Judaism has never expected the Messiah to be different from any other man, there can be no question that in the first century, many Jews, both those attracted to Yeshua and those uh, repelled by him, understood that the Messiah would be more than human. But how much more? How much more human would he be? When do you know as much as angels? But then which angels? Is he higher or lower than Michael and Gabriel? Which angel? We'll establish that here at the very end. Jewish angelology, truly there's a thing called that, had become very complex during the six centuries before Yeshua where among angelic orders did the which of the uh, where pardon me were the uh, uh, among the angelic orders did the Messiah fit? In other words, where did Messiah fit inside this order of angels? They, there was a debate. There were studyings of this, but the decisive answer given here is nowhere. He they don't fit. He's above them all, as the verse from the Tanakh cited in the rest of the chapter are intended to prove, which is Psalms one ten. But I want to go into the New Testament a little bit, and uh, I believe my message is going to be short. I do believe that. We'll see. Because there's something I want to tie together with what we talked about last week that I think is when we start thinking about authority, it's so critical. But let's look over here at Philippians 2.9 first. For this reason, what reason is that? Well, if you take your Bible and flip over there, I want to stop right here because I should have put this text up there. But here's what the Lord, sometimes you write stuff and then the Lord shows you something else like when I'm in there preparing this morning. I want to read this to you so that we can understand this text right here. I'm going to keep the text up. I know on my, my online people are going to go crazy. But here's what I want you to do. If you have your Bibles, please open your Bibles or your cell phones, your, whatever, whatever your Bible looks like. And I want you to open up to Philippians chapter 2. Remember the connector, right? We said thus, right, in Hebrews. Here we have another connector for this reason. Why is he saying for this reason? Well, let's look. Let's look at what the Bible says. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. I want to go in verse 6. I'll give you a second. All right. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 6. Who, <laughs> you can't make this stuff up, guys. Who, though existing in the form of God, did not consider to be equal to God a thing to be grasped, 
But he emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave, becoming the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So it's establishing the deity of Messiah. Understand that. So he establishes, who was he? He was God in form and then relieved himself of that and became equal, he's equal to God, but then he emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave. In other words, he became human. It's powerful. Now watch this. Now we can go into verse 9. For this reason. God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. Now, I'm not, we're not sacred namers here. We've talked about that before. Uh, This could be a great study for you. That's wonderful. But he has the name. Verse 10, that at the name, let me try to keep up here. And he gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Yeshua. Why Yeshua? Well, we know Yeshua, what it means, right? Yahshua. God's salvation. Every knee will bow, or every knee should bow. This is powerful. Remember what we're talking about. Remember context. In heaven, and on earth, and under the earth. Now, I want you to put this in your spirit tonight. Because this is going to mean something at the end of the service, where it all, when I bring it all together. So powerful. Who is he above? Everybody, everything in heaven and on the earth and under the earth. And every tongue, oh, go back there. Sorry about that. And every tongue profess that Yeshua the Messiah is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let there be no mistake here. This is Yeshua, the Son of God, God in the flesh. There is not one iota of authority, none ever established, now or ever will be established, that will be greater than him. This idea is so powerful. I mean, think about this. Here we go. Think about this for a second. What is the author saying? Is there anyone more highly exalted? Is there anyone worthy of more praise? Is there anyone worthy of more worship? Think about the statement. Don't overlook it and think, oh, I'm in church today, so I'm just going to be spiritual. Don't miss this. This will change your life. Can you picture this for a second? Does anyone have more authority than that of Messiah? Let me rephrase it. Does anything have more authority than Messiah? Are we sure? I'm just asking. Do the angels bow to you? See, I can't express this enough. Everything must be placed under his authority. Listen to me. Everything has to be placed under his authority. Some of y'all haven't got it yet. You're going to be... Here's the question. All right, here it is. You ready? Do you really believe it? Now, don't answer out loud to make yourself sound spiritual and ignorant here in a minute. Because I'm going to make a statement that may offend a couple of you. And I'm not trying to offend you. I want, you to, I want us to put our thinking caps on for a second. Like, if we believe this, do we believe that Yeshua is and has all authority in heaven and earth, both above, on, and beneath? We do. Okay. Do you worry? Come on, somebody. You have fear? What about the things we don't like? What about your bad habits? Anger. Don't mention them out. <laughs> Introspection. Introspection. Listen, listen now. For real, listen, guys. I want you to inter- think about these things. Do you walk in anxiety and fear, trepidation? But wait a minute. We just made a huge statement. And the statement was, you confess, well, some of you in here confess, that you believe that Yeshua has all authority both above the earth, in heaven, on the earth, and underneath the earth. Did we not just say that? 
This is why I want you to just, I just want you to think, this is not, I'm not trying to punch you in the gut with because of unbelief, but I want you to understand who it is that we worship. Who's in charge? Who's got your back? The next question is, we talked about the bad habits, the things in our life that we just simply can't get, get rid of. Well, here, let me ask you then, who have you given the authority to? Who's on the authority of your heart? Who sits on the throne of your heart? Now, I know, I get it, right? Because I'm one of them guys, too. I can come into church, and all day long, I'm in church, I'm around all my brothers and sisters, I'm not going to say, well, it's me. Like, I don't want to say that. But there are times. There are times in my life, believe it or not, I don't want to be in church. There are times in my life where I wake up, I don't want to do Christian stuff. Come on now, I'm being serious, man. Y'all want to laugh. There are times I wake up and I'm just like, what is the purpose? Why am I doing this? What about when you're battling a battle? And it's so easy that people walk up to you, you just got to have faith. You just got to have faith, sister. That's it. You just ain't got faith. You ain't healed because you ain't got faith. You just need to to fast more, Dawn. That's what you need to do. You're just not fasting enough. But there are moments, listen to me for a minute, just listen to me. There are moments in our human understanding that we relinquish that authority of our hearts over to something else. There, there are moments that we all do it. And if you don't, we need to have a talk. You need to write a book. And, and we'll give it away free. We'll buy all your copies and give it away to everybody. Because there are people in this room who struggle in their faith. There are people in this room that may not even have any faith. There are people in this room who question whether or not Yeshua is ever coming back. My message isn't to, like, slam those people and and say, oh, you're just not worthy, you're just not a believer. Because when we look through the pages of the Scriptures, we see men and women who have struggled with their identity all the time. All the time. But does that negate the fact that Messiah is still on the throne? Do you know what that does? That gives us hope. That we can turn to him and like like and be be honest. Like, I feel like I'm on the throne right now. Lord, take me off the throne. I need you on the throne. My habit is on the throne right now, and I don't want it to be on the throne. I want you to be on the throne the throne. Worry is on the throne of my heart right now, Yahweh. I need to give this to you. Come on, people. Let's not come into Sabbath, man, and be super spiritual and think we got all the answers. Because there are times where I don't have the answers. There are times where I, I sit across from people in counseling and I can't give them the answer because I don't sit on that throne. There's sometimes where I meet men and women who are struggling in their faith. But yet we put on happy faces. This is not in the nose. This is not even where, like we come into service and we put on these happy faces and we're not really honest. Yep. But he still is on the throne. He's still there. When you're worried about your children and whether or not they're going to be saved, he's still on the throne. Whether you're going to kick this addiction, he's still on the throne. He's above anything that you can imagine. Anything that you will ever go through in your life, he is still on the throne. What is our job? Is in best is in our human ability is to surrender that to him. That he is on the throne. Sometimes it takes weeks. Sometimes it takes an hour. Sometimes it takes years for people to get freedom. To feel the healing in his wings. To experience real love. I don't want us to forget this, man. That Man, this is so powerful. The authority of Yahweh, the authority of Yeshua is absolutely amazing. It's so powerful, in fact, that we see that this was the device of our enemy. He wanted that authority. Right? I mean, isn't that what we find in Isaiah? 
right, Isaiah 14, 12, this is, this is a, a, a description of our enemy, Hasatan, Satan. How you have fallen from heaven, O bright star, son of the dawn. How you are cut down to the earth. You who made the nations prostrate. You who said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. See, when you see the word throne in Scripture, it's representing authority. I will ascend. I'm going to, I'm going to, do, the, I'm going to do a Jordan this morning. Right? I like how you... I'm going to, what's it called? Uh, ASB, what was that, the amp, Amplified Version? I'm going to do the Amplified Version of J Jordan's Bible, but in Mike's terms. You, I said in my heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my authority above the stars of Yahweh. Now, when you understand that statement, right? I mean, how many of y'all love to go look at the stars at night, right? I said this before, I walk outside, you look up, every one of those stars were in place by him. They're held by him. I don't know who I was talking to this, we were talking about the, the sun. And some of y'all are way smarter than me, you'll probably get this, right? How the sun is in perfect position. Like a mile one way or another, we either die and get fried, like french fries, or we freeze to death, the whole earth freezes. I mean, it's that close, and yet it's Yahweh who set it there. Right? He set the sun in its perfect position. And Hasatan comes in with pride, because that's where it started. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne, my authority, above the stars of God. I'll sit upon the mount of meeting in the uttermost parts of the north. I will ascend above the high places. Again, high places. Terminology, biblical terminology for what? Authority of the clouds, I will make myself like Elion. It's powerful. God takes Messiah because of who Messiah is. God in the flesh, and what does he do? He exalts him. He exalts Messiah to the position that's greater than any position. Gives him all authority, and then Satan wants the glory. Satan wants that same thing. And can I, can I give you a secret, guys? It hasn't changed. He is still, I mean, he, our enemy, is still trying to get you to change sides and to bow to someone else's authority. Vote for Jesus. I vote for Jesus. <laughs> Yet Yahweh gives to Messiah the name that is above every name, not in heaven, nor on here on earth. This starts, this authority issue is why pride in a believer is absolutely dangerous. Because see, pride, no matter what form it looks like, will always end up going against authority. It's the heart of rebellion where pride exists. Because it will put you in charge. It allows for you to have the authority of judgment when we place ourselves above the throne of Yahweh. Let the listener be warned this morning. Whose authority are you under? Don't say anything, please. I need you to ask that question for real. Whose authority are you under? You're not under Pastor Mike's authority because Pastor Mike's the pastor of this church. Or Jordan because he's the elder or Pastor Scott or Pastor Dustin. You're under the authority of Messiah and because of that, that's how we live our life. And that's how we develop unity and stay a cod in our community. Pride will destroy your family. It will destroy your children. It will destroy everything you put your hands to. Listen, going into Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, it says, He exists before everything, and watch, in Him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, His community. He is the beginning, the firstborn. From the dead, so that he might come to have first place in some things. Oh, thank you. Somebody said hallelujah back there, and somebody up here went, oh, I'm glad y'all were paying attention on the front row. It says all things. He's the head of the body, he's the head of this community. 
Listen, that's why the Bible calls him a chief cornerstone. Why? Because it's the cornerstone that holds everything together. Everything's built upon that. This is another question. This is, again, a lot of introspection today. I heard somebody say, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not preaching enough, so hopefully you're getting your full this morning. Like, do you think that he can handle your life? Don't say anything. And when I say your life, I'm not talking about in generalization. I'm talking about the issue that you're living with in your life. Your sickness, your disease, your addiction, your relationships, everything. This is why in our, in our community, one of the things that we say that I actually, a good pride, not a negative pride, but a good pride that we have pride in is that one of the things that we say, it comes right out of Psalms. Right out of Psalms, it says this. Look at this. This is something that we have said from the get-go in this community. Unless Adonai builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Watch this. Don't stop there. Unless Adonai watches over the city. I love this because here's what it's going to do. I'm going to back up here. Like, here's what this is going to do. It is going to, like, attack every area. If you, this is a great scripture to just put in your arsenal. When you're having days that just don't make sense, go to Psalms 127, verse 1. Like, look at that. I want you to, I want you to watch the things that, he, that, the, that the psalmist says here. So, unless Adonai, what? Builds the house. Now, let's stop there for a second. All right? What house is he referring to? Well, many of in here will say, the church, it's the church. Okay, cool, I'm down with that. And we believe that, by the way. But what about your house? Does the Lord build your house? Well, Pastor Mike, that's not what, it, I'm just asking. What about your house? Husbands, are you leading your home as if Yahweh is building it? Here's the question. If I did something as a senior pastor of this church that destroyed this community, Yahweh's house, would you still allow me to be the pastor? Okay. Then we got to go. That's going to be the judgment then. How's your house doing? Come on. Oh, well, you're being too. Okay, how about your children? How about your family? Is that not part of your house? How are we doing? Caleb, and I'm bragging on him a little bit, but Caleb gave the Torah portion last week or a couple weeks ago. And one of the things that said that struck out him was the, was the position of fathers. The position of fathers. And young men, while I'm on the topic, how are you doing in preparing to build your house? How are you doing? So we have to build our house. And if we don't build it according to Yahweh, and if Yahweh's not on the throne of that idea and understanding... What's it say? The builders labor in vain. So if Yahweh's not building your home, if you're trying to do it in your own intelligence or your own convictions, instead of what the word of Yahweh says, that was one of the biggest things we had, to, the obstacles that we had to do when we went from a Sunday church to a Sabbath keeping church. If we had to come to an understanding that we had to have this paradigm shift, right? And the paradigm shift was we had to think differently. Because the way we were doing things was not according to Scripture. It was according to tradition. It was according to the way man built churches. And one of the biggest conversations we've had, you maybe have heard this before, it was Dustin and I in the back. And I don't know what brought the conversation up, but that's where the Lord convicted us and said, man, unless the Lord builds the house, then it labors, labors in vain. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, why? Like, like, it's like that aha moment we were talking about last week, that rhema. We finally got a revelation. Wait a minute. We've been trying to build something that we're not supposed to build. Can I tell you something else? We're still not going to build something that he wants to build. Yes, we have elders and we have deacons. We have those that are under his spiritual authority that are walking in that. Life. But the bottom line is we've got to listen and let, the, let Yahweh build the house. But here, it doesn't stop there, does it? The builders lay in vain. Unless Adonai watches over the city. The watchman stand guard, stands guard in vain. This is good. Did you need a passage for Yahweh's sovereignty and his, in, his authority? Here you go. In vain you rise up early 
and you stay up late. Eating the bread of toil. I can preach on that for a minute, man. Some of you are like, like let, me, let me share something with you. You may know this. Let me do a little counseling here. Let me share something. Your job is not your source. Well, it's not your provider. Let me say it that way. Yahweh uses your job to bless you. But not just because you showed up on Monday. Like, here I am. Bless me. If you're living the life you're called to live and you're trusting in Yahweh and you're letting Him be your promoter, then you don't have to worry about anything. You know, that's what he says, right? Look, in vain you rise up early and stay up late, eating the bread of toil, which is labor, for he provides for his beloved, one even in their sleep. Now, I don't know about you. I like the idea of why I'm sleeping, Yahweh's providing. Now, this is not a reason to go quit your job Monday morning. It's that you think you're the source. You think you're the provider. Matter of fact, we've even told you, well, I'm the provider of my home. No, you're not. Yahweh's just, you're just the source that Yahweh uses to bless your family. Yes, you should work. Yes, you should go to work and work your job. But if that's all you do, then it's you that's trying to build your home. And this is really going to make sense when we go into the next passage of this. This is really good. I know I've got to move, man. There's, okay. It can happen. I can do this. Praise the Lord. Y'all are too kind. Some of you are going, you can do it. The others are like, yeah, I'll praise the Lord. I think the ones up front are like, get done. Okay. All right, here we go. So everything is under him. He's your provider. He's your sustainer. He's your protector. He's everything. Why do I say that? Authority. You know what that should do for some of us in this room tonight, today? Is now, here's what you can do. Watch this. Rest. Stop stressing. Stop worrying so much. Breathe. If you're doing what you're supposed to do, then leave the rest to Yahweh. It's his response. You're his son. You're his daughter. Now, this is why I think this is really cool. So, Going back to that other verse where Yahweh's in control, and how do we show that? How do we demonstrate that? Well, I think there's some verses that really demonstrate this. When we look at verses like this one, like Exodus 34, verse 19, every firstborn is of the womb is mine. So what we see is Yahweh following Torah. Jesus is the firstborn. From all your cattle, you're to sanctify the males, firstborn of the ox and sheep. I want you to know a pattern here. Now, this is not a giving message. I'm just trying to show you position of authority. I can, I'm going to read through this, and I want to say something. Firstborn of the ox and the sheep, a firstborn donkey, you're to be redeemed with a lamb. And if you don't redeem it, it, then you're to break its neck. You must redeem all your firstborn sons. No one should appear before me empty-handed. Now, why is that passage inclusive in this statement? Because if we really believe that Yahweh is... In authority. Then every first thing, this is some people call this the principles of the first. So everything that we have, everything, like everything, the first goes to Yahweh. It all belongs to Him. Right? Everything belongs to Him. This is what we're seeing in Hebrews 1. We see the same thing. He's establishing like Jesus is the one that redeems the rest. He's declaring it. Again, we go back to Torah. We see it again in Numbers. Right? Now, this is, a, this is, before somebody checks me on this, this is a conversation to Aaron. But notice what happens here. The first offspring to the womb from all flesh, whether human or animal, offered to Adonai. That's critical in Hebrew thinking. So it's not given to Adonai. It's offered because Aaron can't give something that doesn't belong to him. Aaron can only offer to Yahweh, what's already His. This is, this is, so this is critical. So we say things like, it all belongs to Yahweh. Does it? I'm asking you. This is for you. This is for you going home during, and, and having that moment go, like, am I really giving everything to Yahweh? Do I really believe He's in control? 
then everything belongs to him first. Everything belongs to him. And when we get this, it, it changes. This is the paradigm shift we have to have. Everything belongs to him. Now, knowing that Messiah is first is powerful. It's prophetic towards Messiah. The first always should belong to Yahweh. May I, may I submit something to you just today? Is there something that you need or you're asking Yahweh to do that he's not first in? That he hasn't been given? It's beautiful about Yahweh because you, you, we get to choose. That's the freedom that, that Yahweh gives to us to make our own decisions. And that's the freedom that we have. And he won't violate that. You know why? You know why he doesn't violate that? Because then we become robots. He's not looking for a robot. He's looking for a relationship. See, I equally, Robin is my wife. We equally submit to each other. Not because, like, I feel like I'm weak, but because I want to become strong. And so I submit to her willfully, and she submits to me willfully. We submit to Yahweh in all things, especially in the area of authority. Especially in the area... Of authority. Continuing on, we're going to try to make this. Hebrews 1 7. And regarding the angels, here we go back to the angels. He says, He makes his angels wind and his servants a flame of fire. But regarding the sun, he says, This is the verse that I didn't put up there. Your throne, I want you to see that right there, verse 8. Oh God, is forever and ever your throne. Remember, authority is forever and ever. Listen, listen to this for a minute. His authority is forever. Not just during election season. Not just when you get that raise or when you don't. Not just when you're fighting and you're debating and all these stuff. He is on the throne forever. And a scepter of rightness is a scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. This is powerful. See, we're comparing this authority that he has. Do we see the authority that he possesses? I want us to notice that. I want you to take notice of this authority. He says to his son, your throne, O God, we hit this a lot last week. I don't want to dwell here, but just look at this. This is brilliant. Where is this from? He's quoting from Psalms 44, from Psalms 45. He goes right back to the Tanakh, and he declares what Yahweh's already declared. In setting things up this way, the author is able to prove not only that Messiah is the Son, from whom God's new revelation has come, verse 2, is greater than the angels, but also that this is what his audience should have expected all along, the son's exaltation. In other words, he fulfills promises made in the Jewish scriptures to David and his heirs. What else are we to make with the author? All these different wordings that we see in this text. We go up to Isaiah 9. And look what it says here. Most of y'all know this, right? Especially if you were a Sunday Christian for a while. Verse 9, this is the Christmas thing that they use. For to us, a child is born, a son will be given to us, and the government will be upon his shoulder. Did you see that? Right there. Right there. The government is on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, my Father of Eternity. Of his government and shalom, of Prince of Peace, all right, verse 6, and of the increase of his government and shalom will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it through justice and righteousness from now until forevermore. The zeal that will not throw a vote will accomplish this. I love stuff like this, man, because when I read it, I realize, man, no matter what I'm going through, no matter what people say, no matter what I do, he is on the throne forever. Amen. Amen. Forever. I said this before, but, you know, 
when you messed up and maybe you should have went left and you went right instead, Yahweh didn't wake up and go, good job, Jordan. I got to start all over. Amen. Think about that. He's not surprised. And it's his grace and his love that compels you to repent when you need to repent. But it's also that same love and grace and his Torah that gives us hope. It gives us direction when things are just not adding up. When we're trying to believe for a rhema and a revelation and we're not hearing from him and it's frustrating. And you're like, God, where are you at? He's on the throne. He's still in control forevermore. Hallelujah. Amen. So much in this past text of Isaiah points us back to Yeshua in the book of Hebrews. We see that he will be called God of my father of eternity. We see that, that the government, his rulership will be on his shoulder. This takes us way back to what we already said, that it's all about him and his authority. I want us to understand this language. The foundation that is being built for the readers of Hebrews is absolutely powerful. He's not only establishing the deity of Messiah, but he's establishing the authority that comes from the Messiah. The point is, it's all laid on Messiah. The point for you today, it's all about Messiah. It's all about Messiah. Don't give up. Don't quit. It's going to be hard. There are going to be moments of self-doubt. There's going to be moments where you lack. Don't give up. He's still on the throne. He's still there. He's still ruling. I thought about that statement that I just made when I was watching the election. Yes, I'm going to get a little political for just a moment. Yeah, crazy, right? But think about this for a moment. Would we still have the same hope that we have right now if the election results went the other way? Yep. Yes. Amen. But do you know that there are people in this country that wouldn't? Because their dependency was upon a human being. Their solution was upon a man that may or may not deceive a whole nation. Like, like I get it, okay? Like, everybody likes this guy. Wonderful. He may be a great politician or a great <clears throat> business leader or whatever you may have, but he is not our Savior. I remember sitting out there, at, I still bring back that, when we were sitting out there at Sukkot last year, and we were all talking. It was like, chitter, chatter, chitter, chatter. I think Betsy and Deb, I think you guys were there. There's a few of us around the campfire. And somebody brought up politics. I don't remember who brought it up. And I just said, you know, not everybody liked the other guys. Everybody likes this guy. And it was so quiet around that campfire. I'm like, let's move on. Let's talk about something else. <laughs> right, let's. Our hope is not in man. Jumping into verse, oh yeah, we're good. Hebrews chapter 1, back to verse 10. And in the beginning, I guess I didn't do that one either. And in the beginning, Yahweh, you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. Again, establishing more authority. They shall pass away, but you remain. Do you see that? I mean, everything out there. Go look outside. The, it says everything in the heaven and the earth and the work of your hand, they shall pass away. That's a whole other message. But you remain. And they will all wear out like clothing. And like a robe, you will roll them up. And like clothing, they will be changed. But you are the same. And your years shall never end. I am so, so glad we serve a Messiah. We serve a, lo a Lord that doesn't wear out. He doesn't. He doesn't wear out. Like when you are lacking faith, we were talking about that earlier, he doesn't wear out. Like you can keep coming back, keep coming back, keep coming back. You can keep crying out to him. 
and he'll continue to answer you. There's no comparison when it comes to to the Lord. He never changes. And sometimes, I'm going to be honest, it is easy for us to forget this. The same God that demonstrated his power in the Torah is the same in the New Testament. This is why I have a problem with folks that we don't believe that God can do the same things that he did back then. There are actual people that live in our communities that don't believe that Yahweh can heal. That the reason why we're sick and all that is because, well, you know, God's punishing you. I don't believe that. I believe what the Bible says that every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above. Now, I do believe that we live in a sinful society. I believe we live in a fallen world. I believe that you and me have a decision, a choice, where we can step out of Yahweh's perfect will and step into this world. But we have the choice. I don't believe that Yahweh, Robbie and I have had this conversation before, and this may, this may, you may go, we can talk about this, it's cool, but I don't believe God says, well, I'm going to make so-and-so have cancer so that I can teach him to have faith. I believe cancer comes because of the sickness of this world. I do. I believe because we wouldn't honor Yahweh with the way we're supposed to prepare our food, and we eat this garbage. I've heard pastors say things like, well, the Lord needed another angel in heaven, so he took someone's baby. Come on, people, man. This, can we wake up and read the Bible and know who he is? I had somebody ask me, he's like, where was God? Where was God when they took my child? I said, he was weeping. He knows every hair on every head. But we live in a broken society. We live in a fallen world that's filled of sin and death and is under a curse. And if there's anything that I can compel you today of why it's so important that when we live our life, we live our life under Torah. Why? Because that's where it, it's good. Doesn't mean it always ends up good, because we do live in a world. Don't forget this. It's easy to forget this. We sing the song, you know, his wonder-working God. He's a wonder-working God. He's a wonder-working God. And you know what? He still is. He still heals. Come on, somebody. He still restores. He still forgives. You need a revelation of Yahweh's word that we talked about yesterday. He still loves. Maybe this is tough because we've heard people say the same things, yet they didn't change. So to know that we have a God that never changes, that never will ever leave you nor forsake you, even into the end of the earth, should bring us hope and faith, no matter what we may be faced with. Now, I want to skip ahead just for a second, just to give you a little taste of what's coming up. But Hebrews 13, 8, Yeshua, the Messiah, is the same yesterday, today, and forever, just in case you forgot. He's the same, guys. He's the same. And let me say this while I'm on this subject, that our same Elohim is not a respecter of person. That's in the Bible as well. Did you know that? He doesn't treat us as our sin deserves. Hallelujah. As I said last week, he's a father and a God that wants to do to his children, especially when we obey his Torah, he wants to bless his children. And some of you may not be experiencing that blessing. And I would just ask privately among yourself, right? Is there an area in your life where you've walked away that you're not trusting in him, that he's not on the throne? Or it could be that God's just saying, you know what, this isn't for you yet. Doesn't mean that he's not in control. Finishing up with chapter 1, yes, I said that. Finishing up with chapter 1, look at verse 13. But to which of the angels have he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemy the footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out for service to those about to inherit salvation? I love what the author does as he places where the angels belong. If we needed more, the author brings the hammer down and commences with, Adonai said to my Lord, again, a direct quote from Psalms 110. 
This is the most telling proof that the, that the son is better than any angel. And he saves it for the last. The angels are simply merely spirits who serve as opposed to the son who rules. But the beautiful thing here is that they not only serve the son, they serve his companions too, who God will deliver. And with that, I'm going to close. Every head bowed, every eye closed. This is a great time to, you know what, let's not do that. I'm sorry, everybody open your eyes up. Look back at me. Hey, hello. I want to do something because I think it's just a testimony because of what we're talking about and how good God is. I felt like, you know, we should show a video. Like, I like videos. And uh, some hard work went into one. For those of you who missed the Sukkot, we're going to give you a little, a little taste. And then we're going to come back and we're going to pray for Yahweh to be and his authority and his will to be done in our lives. And then we're going to be dismissed.